Hey, welcome to the Cam and Otis Show. And uh, you know what? I get to say my favorite intro uh, today, which is one of my really good friends uh, is joining us, an Army veteran, Chris Wright. Good to have you, man. Thanks, Otis. Appreciate yeah. appreciate the invite. Glad to be here. Yeah, this is this is going to be a lot of fun because I got. I'm going to try to keep it out of the beer recipe uh, category, but <laughs> for those of you who don't know Chris, you haven't met me for a beer yet because Chris <laughs> is the founder of Pikes Peak Brewery, and they are an awesome place. And that, and we in the McGregor family just refer to the one your your shop up here in in Monument as the pub. Everybody, nice. everybody who knows me uh, just knows that uh, that's where you'll find me. That if you want to grab a beer, unless you're unless they force me someplace else, yeah. <laughs> uh, we're, we're meeting at the pub. So I I'm just going to say okay. right from the get go, I appreciate that, uh, and I appreciate that y'all are just around the corner from the house. So of course, but of course. I want to get into a bit of the the how did you go from dude in the basement which there's hundreds of thousands of them you know cooking up beer and handing it out to your <laughs> friends and stuff like that to turning it into a business what 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 click that got you going uh, you know so the funny is i i'd always wanted to own my own business mm. um and it started when i was a contractor for carson running in the network and uh working for lucent technologies at the time many, many, many years ago. And my boss came to me and said, hey, would you ever think about starting your own business and so we can contract your position out to you? I'm like, huh, I don't know what that would be like. So then it just started the wheels turning. I'm like, ah, oh, that sounds like a lot of fun. And then I could expand it and I could do this. I could do that. I could grow it to a bigger business. That never ended up happening, but it just started the wheels turning. So I always wanted to, uh, to do that. And um, about that time, I was also uh, started to homebrew and um, and that, you know, I homebrewed for 10 or 15 years. And um, the last couple of years, I, I like to say at, at a moment of weakness after um, months and years of me asking my wife, can I do it? Can I do it? Can I do it? Can I do it? She said, fine, go do your stupid brewery thing. Um, asking me and, about it, right? And yeah. And then she was like, no way. <laughs> Um, so I just ran off and uh, it took about five years to do my business plan and um, just put things together. But, you know, the, the interesting thing is, you know, people ask, you know, what was, you know, what was that one moment that you, you knew that you were going to build a brewery and that type of thing. And, and I say, it's never one single moment. It's just a series of small steps, mm -hmm. right? And then, all of a sudden you turn around, you're like, oh crap, we just opened. What, how did that happen? You know, it's not this huge milestone that you plan for. Um, and uh, it's just, you sit down and you say, all right, well, let's see, if I'm going to open a brewery. What do I want it to look like? You know, what's going to be the guiding principle? Oh, this, all right. So how much, you know, what kind of space am I looking for? How much is that going to cost? Well, how many beers do I have to sell to pay for that? And you just one little small step after another and that's how everything in life is right yeah. is um to be successful and accomplish your goals the first step is always the hardest right then you just do little steps you know if you're going to climb a mountain take that first step right mm -hmm. drive to the base of the mountain look up and take your first step and then you can you can climb it um so that you know that's really kind of how i got started is yeah just <laughs> just just putting one foot in front of the other you mentioned uh, that it took you like five years to get the business plan together. Was that a conscious mm -hmm. thing or like you're going slow and steady to make sure you got everything right? Or was that all of the barriers that came up that you didn't see coming? Um, yes to all of those, right? <laughs> um, so I wanted to get it right. Um, and we were kind of still just looking for the perfect location, perfect spot. Um Thought I had thought we had uh, a location picked out, and then the hop crisis of 2009, eight uh, happened, and that scared me off for a bit. I'm like, ah, let's just hold tight for a couple of years to figure this out, let things kind of stabilize. So we did, um, and fortunately, that allowed us to find our current location. Um, uh, and uh, so, you know, but along those lines, because it took so long to 
to find the perfect location and sign the lease. It allowed me to, in my spare time, just really work on the business plan and, and try to think of every possible, you know, bit of the, of the business and just think through what are the potentials, you know, how do you deal with this obstacle or how do you generate this revenue and that type of thing. And that's really the benefit of a business plan. You know, a lot of people say when you start a business, um, you, day one, you throw out your business plan and they're right, you do. Um, but it's important to go through that exercise because it kind of ingrains in you, you know, you, you think through all the possibilities, well, maybe not all the possibilities, but many of them. And it really prepares you to face all of the challenges that you're going to face on day one. So you spent some, uh, what, how many years were you in the army? Cause I, I I'm getting a little history before I ask <laughs> the question on this. Yeah. Uh, I was in for about six years, six years. Okay. That's, six that's years. long enough to get ingrained into the army's planning process. You know, the MD. Oh, no. absolutely. Yeah. So that's, absolutely. that's my absolutely. question because I've, I've mentored several veteran entrepreneurs yeah. who've done just what you did. Uh, mm -hmm. and what I always throw them back to is, the MDMP, the five paragraph field order. So when you, the when five you paragraph down, field order, that's absolutely correct. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So that was, yep. that was that, the tool that you went back to, huh? And, and almost subconsciously, right? Because that's, that was my, what I was familiar with, um, what I knew worked um, when we, you know, nothing you think people that aren't in the military don't understand, but, you know, starting a business was a lot easier than, getting my uh, platoon ready to go to war or to, uh, to Bosnia, right. Is because you're thinking, Oh my gosh, people are going to shoot me, shoot at me. You know, that forces you into that planning stage. Um, and that's a lot more challenging than opening a business for sure. Yeah. That, that, I love hearing that because uh, you know, it is, it's, uh, I, I mean, that's, that's my, to use another army phrase, that's my foot stomper always. Mm -hmm. is. Man. Ain't, ain't nobody come up with a better way of doing it yet. At least not that I found. So in, in how many it, hundreds of years? Yeah. 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 So uh, in that same vein, how did you, how did you create a vision? Because I, I love the fact that you're, you know, I did these small steps as we move forward, but you still had to know where you were going. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. how did you, how did you do that? Yeah. You know, so the interesting is um, when I was a young lieutenant, got stationed in Germany, right out of uh, college, and that's where I first understood that pubs are different than bars, and pub is where life happens outside of the work in the home and that type of thing. So that was my guiding principle, right? As I wanted to create that third space where the community gets together over handcrafted beer, um, and I did that from that experience in, um, in Europe. And then when I was home brewing um, in Monument, in our little Jackson Creek subdivision, a brand new subdivision where all, all the families are kind of in the same place in life. And it, almost every weekend, either someone would come over to our house or I'd go over to their house and we'd, and either, you know, I would bring beer or they would uh, have beer at my place. And it just really brought us together as a community. I'm like, you know what? The world needs more of these type of places. So that was the guiding principle to, to start with. In fact, our motto is life is better when lived together. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have anything to do with beer. We just think that that's a way that we can build community. Is, is it, Beer kind of just breaks down barriers. Um, and I think in this world, especially today, the more you can get together uh, over a beer, regardless of where you came from, what you believe in, what political party you are, you know, the more you can break down those barriers and find that thread of commonality, the better off we are. And, and I think we can all do that with almost anyone on this planet. You can find something that's, that's common between uh, two people. And then you build on that, right? And beer kind of helps uh, find the, that thread of commonality. Yeah, there's a, uh, I want to say it was Heineken. I think it was Heineken that did that, that, that exact thing. They brought, they found people who were polar opposites in their beliefs and views. Mm -hmm. And they brought them mm -hmm. into a room, just the two of them with two beers. And uh, yeah. yeah, just uh, it, it, <laughs> and by the end, they were probably like slapping each other on the back. And yeah, uh, yeah exactly. They, every one of them was, you know, walking out, you know, handshakes or even arm in arm yeah. sort of thing. And, and like, we're going to do this again. 
And, and that's what I, that's what I love about our monument tap room is a stranger walking into that monument tap room. You would think that it's, you know, a hundred people all the, exactly the same, but there, but I know all these people and there's so many varied backgrounds, beliefs, histories, cultures, all this stuff that, but you put a beer in their hand and, and all the differences melt away. Yeah. Yeah. So, it's a wonderful secret, uh, secret juice. Isn't it? <laughs> it, is. it really is. It really is. Uh, I got to ask Chris, you're talking about having neighbors over in the early days there. How many people did you scare away with some bad recipes or were you a bit of a prodigy when it comes to this? <laughs> <laughs> no. So the, the funny, thing, I like to tell the story that, um, for several years, um, when I was home brewing, uh, my wife actually described my beer as ass beer. Um, <laughs> because she didn't like it. And thank goodness she told me what she really thought. Um, cause that made me sit down and think, well, gosh, you know, all, all these other home brews I've had that are good. Uh, I use the same malt as they do. I use the same hops as they do. I use the same yeast as everyone else. Oh, it's the water. And then it dawned on me that it's the water dummy. And when I've paid attention to the water, it, it changed my, uh, brewing career and, and changed my life forever. Wow. So yeah, there, there's definitely been some, some bad batches along the way, but I've learned from those, I think. Um, a second ago, you mentioned, you know, talking about, uh, you know, the camaraderie that beer creates, uh, you mentioned new people coming into the pub. I'm curious, is there anything that you've thought about as far as thinking the monument location? I, I unfortunately haven't been down to the one in the Springs yet, uh, mm -hmm. but you get the people who are in there, regulars like Otis, and you know, you get all these people. The new person in there, how do you avoid it becoming almost like clicky is was my thought. Because it's a neighborhood thing. And you can feel a little awkward coming into that kind of an environment. What what have you done as a culture yeah. to help prevent that? You know, the that that's an interesting thing is is someone once said that you walk in as a stranger in about five or ten minutes you'll start to know somebody um, unless you just don't want to. But yeah, it can be intimidating. You walk in like, did I, am I walking into a private party? What's going on here? You know, but um, so I think we do that because in, in the monument tap room, you know, we don't have a host sitting you at a table. It, people come in, find wherever they're going to sit. And mm -hmm. inevitably they start walking around the tap room, seeing who else is there and saying hi to everybody. And I would be shocked if someone didn't come over to someone who was there for the first time and introduce themselves or ask them how they're doing or smile at them, you know, that, that type of thing. So it's really the community uh, that allows that to happen less much, you know, what I, what I've done or what I do every day. Do you think that comes from you and the rest of the, uh, I almost said the pub team, the Pike speak team? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think we kind of set the foundation, but the mm -hmm. people that, that, really go out of the way to say hello to someone who are who is new that's that's the the people have been coming into the pub for the last 10 10 plus years that that's an interesting thing and uh really i'd, I'd love to kind of get how you're finding those people because that's that's a big one you know not just in the you know the time period that we're in with this great resignation sure. uh, mm -hmm. that everybody's coined but but how do you find the right person to main, maintain your culture? So the interesting thing is we have a mug club uh, called the Craft Beer Society. Um, and we started that day one when we opened. Um, and the intent behind that is to have people feel like they're a part of the pub. And instead of this just being the pub, it's, it's my pub, right? And I think that kind of laid that foundation. And people who join that want to belong to and feel like they have a piece and a part of, of the Pikes Peak Brewing Company. And I think that is the catalyst to have them come out and welcome people to, to their pub, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and it happens all the time. So I, I think this, the, the Craft Beer Society um, is, is the reason uh, you know, we have those, those good folks. I, I, I want to shift it, though. I want, I'm, I'm talking about your team. How are you, how are you finding mm -hmm. your team? And oh, to maintain your culture. Right? Great explanation about the, the larger picture and the client. Sure. I love, but I'm really, yeah. What, what about your team, the people that, you know, you, you signed the paycheck for. So the interesting thing is we have typically we'll do 
uh, a group interview with, with folks. So it's not ever just one person interviewing someone else. It's typically three or four people sitting down and have a conversation with the, the person who is applying for a job. And that really, it, it can be a little intimidating at first, but it really mm -hmm. uh, allows people to get a sense of the person who's uh, applying. And we try to hire like-minded people all the time. Right. In fact, one thing that we do in our interview process, we say, bring in your favorite beer and sell it to us and describe it and tell us why it's your favorite beer. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that really is a window into uh, their personality. And we've been really successful at hiring people that have the same uh, values uh, that that we do. Um, and it's not just the boss interviewing them. It's people they're going to work with. Right? And that's really important to me is. Um, is making sure you like the people you work with. Hmm. Um, what have you done to, uh, beyond the beyond that interview process, what have you done in the onboarding to kind of keep that moving and not have it be a like, here's everybody and it's like, all right, go do your own thing. Yeah, so we actually do a pretty intensive uh, training program. Um, it's two or three sessions over hmm. um, a week or two where we talk about the why. Right? Why are we here? Why, why are we successful? What got us to, to this point? <clears throat> and really have people understand the history and the philosophy and the foundations behind the company. I think that's really, really important uh, mm -hmm. to, to do so people get a really good understanding. And we always have that training in a group environment. So we never hire or rarely hire just kind of one person. Typically, it's three or four people. So they go through that training together, build that mm -hmm. bond uh, as a group instead of just individual training. You know, we don't, it, it wouldn't have the same outcome, I think, if we sat someone in front of a computer screen and said, watch this video. Right. So I, I think that's really the, the difference. So uh, did you get that from the Army too? Your, your basic training <laughs> cohort? Uh, <laughs> because Sub, Subconsciously, 90% of probably what I do comes from the army, Otis. <laughs> yeah. It's 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 hard not to, isn't it? <laughs> yep, yep, it is. It is. So speaking of, speaking of which and what we got from the army, things have happened and and your business, a, a public place that people come into, was slapped upside the head with the Rona two years ago. Mm, yeah. How yep. did how how did you manage that that significant event in in the business um you know that was a challenge uh for sure but it was a challenge for for everyone um you know our the the clientele we have up in in monument uh uh absolutely wrapped their arms around us and um came there drank out you know drank beer in tents uh in february in colorado with snow happening uh they picked up to go stuff. And, and really that's, that was a big reason behind uh, us surviving the pandemic. Um, and, and, and I would be remiss if I also didn't say, you know, the, some of the support from the government helped, um, you know, and, and they should, right. If the government shuts you down, they should be there to help make, make sure you survive. Um, so that was another reason we, we were able to, to weather the pandemic, but primarily it was the support from the community up in Monument. So I had the, I, I was, uh, Suzanne and I were lucky enough to hang out with uh, Dave Ramsey and his team right in the middle mm. of it. And uh, oh, well. one, one of the things, well, us and 500 other people. Uh, so yeah. it wasn't like I had a one-on-one -on -one with Dave. You, you don't uh, sound as lucky now. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, I know. No. But uh, you didn't have to leave that out next time you say that. Yeah, I know, I know. Yeah, yeah, no, Norman, cut it. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so one of the things that Dave talked about, because you know, there it happened to them too, uh, mm. and they were very much affected by it. Uh, you know, and what do we do? How do we do it? Do we bring people in? Do we send them? You know, all those sort of things that all of us business right. owners were and business leaders were going through. I thought it was really interesting. He. They went into uh, you know a, a senior leader uh, crisis planning. Uh, mm -hmm. they, they literally brought everybody in to the conference room and and said, "All right, how are we going to do this?" Uh, and and did it that way. So uh, did 
did you do that or was it more you and your wife kind of sitting at home going, all right. Uh. No. So I, I have a great team. Uh, I have an executive staff uh, that leaned on us really hard uh, during the pandemic. You know, so we kind of saw it coming a couple of weeks beforehand and we started putting together a plan, um, you know, contingency plan. What happens if we do this? What happens if we do that? Um, and, and they, you know, those group of uh, that group of uh, folks are what really helped uh, and and allowed us to survive as well. At least put a, a plan together uh, to be able to survive. And and that's who came up with, you know, we did uh, meal uh, packages to go, you know, with bratwurst and six packs, and you know that was all their idea. Um, and yeah, they 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 were fantastic. Which, which Miss Suzanne and I bought a couple of them. I, I just got to say, we <laughs> yeah. well, you love that opportunity. <laughs> well, and I want to add as, as a customer in this kind of a thing, even though I didn't, I wasn't up at the pub very much during that um, or picking up the to goes because I was down here in Tucson, but bringing the food component to with the, with the beer is a huge mm -hmm. thing. That's such a, I think it's a kind of like small thing that people wouldn't necessarily notice, but thinking back through the pandemic times, looking at my local places, you don't want to go to two places to, you know, spend right. the time going and getting the food here, then getting the drinks there. You want to get them both. And mm -hmm. so for you to bring the food component there so that you can step up into that competitive area, I think is really mm -hmm. smart. Sure. Absolutely. No, thanks. It was, it was a brilliant idea. Not, not, not one of mine, but <laughs> that, uh, going back to that executive staff. Yeah. yeah. Um, with, with, uh, you know, kind of looking back into, you know, how you reacted in the contingency planning and all of that, I kind of want to shift it to looking forward a little bit. Um, what, you know, some sort of, I guess, like Rona contingency plan moving forward or anything that you've changed just to be ready for that type of big interruption looking forward? What does that look like? Oh, gosh. Well, you know what it did teach me is... Um, you need, you need to plan for the rainy days. Right. And, uh, I am really good at, uh, forecasting and planning revenue numbers, but really mm -hmm. bad at, uh, expense numbers. So I need to get better at that and, um, and build, uh, some savings and war chests that, uh, to allow us to, to survive those type of events, not there yet, but, uh, that's really what we're focused on now is, is making us more financially healthy, uh, so we don't have to survive on government, uh, the government help. One of the things I, I, I'm, I'm feeling, and uh, I, I've dealt with this with uh, entrepreneurs I've worked with over the years, <clears throat> is, and, and I just imagine in, in the beer industry, microbrewery industry has got to be prevalent. How do you stay focused and keep from going, yeah, that, that, that recipe, and I'll just pick on elephant rock, that elephant rock recipe. Yeah, that was yesterday. Let's try this one and let's try this one. And let's, so that you, so that you can go forward and actually, you know, develop that clientele base or, or know where success is and build on success. How, how are you dealing with that? Oh gosh. You know, I, th that's a good question. I, cause it is easily, you can easily get distracted by the, the, the shiny new object and, and that type of thing, but you always got to go back to what do you do well? Um, and, you know, cause we started, uh, at one point we tried to ship uh, beer to China. Uh, we actually did a contract brew, um, and, uh, for a UK company to ship to China. Um, and they fumbled that and we and never went anywhere. And then we were looking at multiple States. We tried California and at some point, you know, I, I sat the, the team down and we brainstormed and said, you know, let's, let's get back to what we do really well. And that is creating an environment that brings people together over a handcrafted beer. And so that's when we kind of shifted gears from looking at growing our wholesale uh, distribution and, and new, bringing on new states and new territories to let's build the logger house downtown, a place in Colorado Springs that has that, that atmosphere and tries to, to bring the community together. So you, you do have to sometimes shift gears and, and just come back to what's made you successful and what is the foundation of the why. 
I'm going to guess a guy like you with the analytics, you probably did some math on that and, and <laughs> use that as, as some data points to say, okay, yes, no, what's the probability of success and all those sort of things. Were you, were you able to apply that? Sure. No, absolutely. But it was also a lot of learning too, right? Because mm -hmm. um, I'm a big proponent of not making the same mistake twice. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so when we went to, to California, um, you know, we weren't very successful um, or not, at least not as successful as I would have liked um, because we weren't the local brand and craft beer um, as a whole is almost a victim of our own success where, um, you know, people want to drink local beer. And it was, it was a hard reality to go somewhere and be like, this is great beer. And people are like, yeah, but eh, it's not, it's not from here. I'm going to drink my local. So that kind of was another catalyst to say, let's go back to what we're, we're really good at, which is being that local pub. Uh, when you're, when you're kind of looking forward and like casting that vision, how do you, uh, how do you balance the desire for like growth and getting it out there, you know, getting get some cans to Tucson, Arizona, maybe, and, you know, different things like that <laughs> while also wanting to, you know, have, have the, you know, being big while also having the good, which is the pub and the logger house and that type of community area. How do you, how do you balance those two as you're looking forward? And not very well. <laughs> um, but as you know, it, and, and it changes uh, over time when we built out our expansion. It, it, well, it, it evolves and changes with the market. When we mm -hmm. built out our big expansion and monuments was that five, six years ago, you know, our distributor said, I'll sell every drop of beer that you want to make. Um, well then, and that was at the moment at the time where that model was go out and get four or five out of, out of state markets and, and you're going to be um, fat, dumb and happy. Uh, well, the market definitely changed quickly over the last you know several years where that model doesn't work it, it, as much. So I think you have to explore uh, a lot of possibilities. Um, you always have to be open to new ideas um, to allow you to evolve and, and look for things that uh, changes in the market or things that are going to make you successful. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, you, you can't just go blindly into them. You have to plan for those things do some calculations, do the math. At, and, and it's really the math to say, does this sound feasible when, you know, if you're, if you're figuring out your expense ratios for uh, a new endeavor, um, you have to go through and, and make some reasonable assumptions. But at the end of the day, you know, if it comes back and says, you have to sell as much beer as Budweiser to make this profitable, does that sound reasonable? Um, and it's, I call it the reason, reasonability test that I do all the time. Uh, does it, or feasibility, you know, does that seem feasible to be able to sell that much beer? And that's your green light or red light uh, when it comes to that part of the new project. So it, it seems like that you, you have this really awesome balance, which I think a lot of, a lot of business owners should strive to reach where you have your, you know, you feel, I guess you could say fulfilled with the pub and with the logger house and serving the local community. And then you mm -hmm. can kind of use that as the launching point for the ambitiousness of still like, okay, well, I still want the beers to be sold all over the place. Like I'd, sure. you know, I still want other people drinking it. And then you kind of have this balance to where, you know, you're safe. You have, you have, you know, what you could call a success already that you can build on top of and then still mm -hmm. have that ambition to go out and do those things, but doing it safely, just like you're saying. No, and, and that you bring up a great point is you have to have that foundation because a lot of times people, and, and we've been guilty of this uh, at times in the past, you know, try to uh, stair step and jump um, to the next thing without that foundation. Mm -hmm. um, and that comes back to bite you in the ass uh, for sure is you have to get back, establish that foundation, and then you can tiptoe forward instead of leaping, trying to leap mm -hmm. forward. And which, which just brings me to a point uh, because, you know, with, with what I do with coaching uh, soon-to-be veterans, I would say there's probably about 25% of them that want to get into uh, maybe a little bit more on the entrepreneurship side, but mm -hmm. there's distillers and there's brewers. As, as, a, as a vet, what's, what's the lesson that you learned in shifting to uh, from basement brewer to business that – that you want to share with uh, other vets? You know, I, I think you got to plan. You mm. got to plan, look at numbers 
and try emotions can guide you and push you, but you have to decisions have to be based in numbers and facts. Right. Um, but you have to have that balance, right? Because you can't just be a numbers person or else, you know, no, no creative stuff would ever get done. You have to have that drive, but you have to balance that with, with uh, analytical processes. That, that's so here, here's the follow on to that or, or Camden, help me out with the right word. Is this a corollary? You'll have to correct me here after I ask this question using big fancy words this morning. What's, <laughs> what's the, what's the army leadership lesson that you learned you know, during that first duty station, whether it was with your platoon sergeant or, or whomever, that still carries through uh, with you today. I think I would oh, say that's, uh, that's a tangential question. Tangential, thank tangential. you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had my cup of coffee this morning. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I, I think it, uh, it's the planning aspect, mm-hmm. right? Um, that, that, that's been a huge piece of, of uh, what I've carried over from, from the Army is, is that, you know, make a plan and, and go execute it. I love, I love that. And, and what I, what I find uh, interesting, we, we hit on it very early on. I usually try to get, draw it out after I've warmed you up a bit, but you dove right into it. You know, the MDMP, the five paragraph field order, because mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's really, for those of you that have not spent time in the army and the Marine Corps, sorry, air force and Navy. You, you, <laughs> you, you, you just, uh, look it up, talk to, talk to an army guy, talk to, a Marine Marines call it something different, but it's the same thing because they're Marines. Yep. They got to call it different and it's a <laughs> damn good process. So it is, uh, it is. Don't reinvent the wheel just because you're doing something different. The process still works. So mm-hmm. where, where does, where do micro breweries go now? You've got, you, you've, you've hit some plateaus and, and you've taken some risk and tried some new things and, and now you've got the, this beautiful, mm-hmm. again, those of you in Colorado Springs, you ain't been to the logger house. It's really a cool building. So the, that's, the, that's what's behind me right here. This is, I'm, I'm sitting in the logger house right now for yes, all you folks yes. out there. Yeah. So it is the, the, the atmosphere of the building. It's very different from up here in Monument. Uh, mm-hmm. And I, I think that's designed by purpose because of where mm-hmm. it's, it's location. So it's just a really cool atmosphere building, but, but what's, where do you go next? <sighs> Um, I wish I knew. <laughs> uh, it, it, we're, we're taking um, suggestions at this point, right? <laughs> right, 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 right. So, gosh, um, I think, um, so are you asking, oh, let me, uh, that's a good question. Um, I, I think the on-premise, the brewery, the community aspect of my business will continue uh, to to be here and continue to be that foundation. Um, as far as craft beer as a whole, I think I think there's still some some hard times in in front of us, especially in the next couple of years, where you have new new uh, beverages coming out, uh, seltzers, um, ciders, that you know that type of thing. Um, I think there'll be some more pressure on craft beer, uh, and as well as pressure from uh, the bigger international breweries to um, kind of capture some of that craft market. I think that'll always be a, 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 a point that we need to watch out for and you know, maintain some independence. Uh, I think as this kind of next wave or this current wave of craft brewers or people who've been around for 10 or 15 years as they begin to ponder uh, retirement and exiting strategies, it's going to be important to maintain that independence. Um, but I don't think, you know, I, I think there'll be a decrease in independent breweries uh, moving forward. You think it's kind of like a bubble? Like when we talk about the real estate, do you think it'll, it'll kind of, we've, we've kind of hit a point and all of a sudden there's going to be a bunch of, because I know a couple of them downtown have gone out of business in the last couple of years. Yeah, I, I don't know if it's a bubble. It's just kind of this natural progression uh, mm. that ha- it's a life cycle mm-hmm. um, that you know was probably um, hastened by the pandemic uh, a bit. Um, but I think you know it's just this natural. It, it'll ebb and flow. Um, 
throughout throughout history. I mean, it's craft beer's not going anywhere, but uh, there'll be high points and low points. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate you sharing that. I was just curious if you wanted to be the next Coors because I mean, they're just up the road. You can go <laughs> knock them out, right? <laughs> nope, nope. I'm I'm happy with my little corner of the world. So there you go. <laughs> and so uh, Cam Camden when he was uh, when he was doing a couple of his businesses, I think it was. You had the added, I think you had the vision of conquering the world with yours, with with, with at least Verbi, right? <laughs> oh yeah, no, I mean, frank, frankly, when I write any of my business plans, I'm thinking about conquering the world on them. Whether or not I get there, I'll be okay. But, uh, but the lesson well, and, that I'm and, taking from Chris today is you got to have that foundation to where you're happy with. You know, I'm happy that I'm serving Tucson. I'm happy that I'm serving Monument, Color Space, whatever it is. And then you can go try to conquer the world from there. And that's a much nicer place to be than doing what I've done before, which is standing right here without much of a foot to stand on and then going out and trying to conquer the world. Yeah. Well, and it goes back to that, you know, that first small step and it's not any giant leap. It's a series of small steps. And that's, that's the same if you're just starting out or you've been in business for, for 10 years. If you, if you leap, you're going to fail. You got to take small steps. So, uh, Chris, you had mentioned, uh, you know, when you're talking about the future of it, you mentioned uh, ciders and seltzers and that type of thing. Uh, what does your experimentation process look like for bringing on new beers, branching out into those type of different things? I also, outside coming in, full, full disclosure, I don't know the different processes there. I understand mm-hmm. distilling and brewing. I don't know where cider and seltzers fall into that categories, to be fair. So if you want to answer that first, that would actually be great. <laughs> um, so uh, with seltzers and ciders and all that, mm-hmm. is that? Yeah. Yeah. So so seltzers are technically a beer because it uses a grain-based sugar. Uh, so breweries are allowed to make seltzers. Um, but other than that being a grain-based uh, sugar, there's hardly any, um, you know, commonality with, with beer. Um, uh, and then ciders are, um, they use fruit. So it's more, it's classified as a wine. Hmm. Um, so only vintners, uh, can make ciders. Like you have two different, uh, licenses. You have a brewery license and a winery license and then distillery Mm -hmm. license. So, you know, each one of those are, are separate and, um, we can't, uh, you can't cross over. I, I can't ferment anything that's based in fruit and okay. I can't distill. Yeah. So then, um, uh, so then from there with, without the ciders, cause you can experiment into that, maybe a little bit into the seltzer world. Uh, wh- how mm-hmm. do you control your experimentation process? We kind of already talked about not wanting to chase the shiny object, but also you could play with the shiny object in your basement. Like you used to a while ago, couldn't you? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you know, I, I uh, talk to other brewers and, and read industry trends and, um, there'll always be something that kind of piques my interest is, yeah, maybe we should try, or, you know, for instance, we have, um, a, uh, I was reading just the other day that, um, it, there's a new, uh, yeast, uh, that's out. And I asked the team, Hey, let's play around with this yeast. Cause we're supposed to get different flavors for hazy IPAs and that type mm. of thing. So, you know, just looking at what's happening in, in the industry is always uh, interesting and fun. Um, and then we'll, we'll try it out on our little, our 10 barrel brew house up in Monument, uh, typically. Mm-hmm. And, um, that's, it's always fun to, to experiment. Yeah. Is that, is that usually, um, like completely different areas that you're trying to experiment into, or is it a little bit more like incremental? Like I'm picturing, you know, I'll, th- I'll throw out one of my favorite beers up there, Gold Rush. Are you, mm-hmm. are you making Gold Rush too? Are you improving it? Are you making the sister beer or you go over there making something completely new to add to the menu? How do you, how do you usually approach that? All, all of the above, right? In fact, we just um, came out with a, a new revamp recipe of our Elephant Rock IPA uh, that kind of evolved with, uh, with market with the market and with taste and, and that type mm-hmm. of thing. Um, so, so it's some of that, and then we'll hear about a new ingredient or yeast, like I was just saying. So we want to play around with mm-hmm. that and come up with something completely new. Um, so it's, it's all of the above. It's all of the mm-hmm. above. Sounds like I need to get up there and try the new elephant rock. I'll bring, <laughs> I'll bring my apron. I got for Christmas that says the official dad beer nice. elephant rock on nice. there. I got one. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Uh, yes, uh, Camden, thank you for uh, asking those questions that I was trying not to dive into the uh, recipes and what beer's next because uh, 
you know, I, I'm even, I'm, I'm resisting the urge to put in the plug for my favorite beer and why it's only seasonal, but that's okay. There's a reason it's seasonal, I'm sure. Uh, but <laughs> man, this is a uh, fascinating and, and the, the business lessons I think are, are great. And, and for me, uh, boy, I, I've got a couple of them that I, that I, that I look at as the, the, what I learned, but I think the, the one I'm going to go back to is the, is the foundation one, which is, which is that is, is know what you do good and, and build on that. Don't, don't chase the shiny objects and dilute what you do good because mm -hmm. if you're successful in that, there's people that are buying that for a reason and don't, and, and by the way, I think I've seen some brewer, some of the craft breweries, microbreweries that do that uh, where they, they jump off of that, that beer that everybody liked. Uh, Mm -hmm. And that's just such a simple thing that for some reason, I think we, and, and that's the reason I think it's my lesson learned is because it's a great reminder is quit chasing the shiny object, do what you do well, and then do it better. I think that's, mm -hmm. that's the lesson. Camden, how about you? Yeah, that, that was a big one for me. Definitely. Uh, also having that smaller, I, smaller in quotes, I guess, uh, goal of, you know, getting there and getting that kind of fulfillment and logic from that point. But I think a really big one, and I'm not, I'll be honest, I don't know how you apply this to other areas, but it is a huge lesson. And if you can apply this to your business, it's great, is the uh, going through the hiring process, bring in your favorite beer and sell it to us. Whatever your business is, if you can apply that to whatever you're doing, I think that is a great, great system. Mm -hmm. Chris, how about you? What'd you learn? You know, Otis, I, you, you said something earlier that I haven't used the phrase or, or brought up in many, many years, and that's the five paragraph op order. <laughs> and, you know, I had forgotten how much, you know, what I do is, is ingrained in my military training. And uh, I need to bring that to the forefront. So in case I'm dealt with challenges, I can ask myself, how would have, how, how is the military person um, address this, right? And at least start from that uh, perspective. And so I appreciate you bringing that memory back. That's awesome. No, great, great. Because, yeah, it, it is uh, such a foundational tool to use. Camden's actually it learned it by now because he's heard me talk about it so much. <laughs> well, well, I got I to do the plug since you brought it up. You can get the Tribe of Purpose version, findyourpurpose.coach slash decision download the decision guide, which is pulled from the MDMP. There you go. There you go. It's me <laughs> translating 25 years of Green Beret stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Chris, how do get people, <laughs> give, give us the, uh, how do people find you and tell us, tell us where, where the two pub locations are at. Sure. Absolutely. Um, no, and I, and I definitely appreciate you guys having, having me on. Um, so pikespeakbrewing.com. Uh, with an ing, so pikespeakbrewing.com is our website. Uh, we have two locations, um, one in Monument, which is the world headquarters, as I like to say. Um, and that's where we produce everything we package and, and all of our R&D and all that stuff. And then um, in August of 2020, we opened the Logger House. So it's the Pikes Peak Brewing Logger House. And that's uh, downtown Colorado Springs, 514 South Tejon Street. Uh, it's a beautiful a um, uh, place that just focuses on brewing lagers and as part of the Kawadi Food Hall. So uh, a bunch of independent food vendors uh, in, in here as well. Uh, that's, that's great. I appreciate that. Uh, appreciate your time this morning too and sharing with us. It's uh, uh, always good to catch up with you and, and share those stories, man. I really appreciate it. Of course. Of course. Camden, run us out. All right. Thank you all for listening to today's show. Special thanks to our guest, Chris Wright, for joining us today and our sponsor, Tribe and Purpose. Find your tribe, find your purpose. You can check out recent episodes of the Cam and Otis show on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts, and check out the full archive at thecaminotashow.buzzsprout.com. The Cam and Otis show is on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Thanks again, and we'll see you all next week.